Okay, so do you, do you have another another story that was very? Um. If you want to. Yes. <laughs> I think I'd rather not say that. Then. Those images is still in my mind. It's it's really hard to get over that. That was that was really bad. And while the father's telling me this, I'm getting downright nauseous interpreting this to the defects worker and she's just unfazed by it, I guess, and she's so used to it. She's just typing away on her on her laptop. My adrenaline just was, um, I was going from one room to the other, one room to the other. There were two dead people um, that just passed away while I was there, um, a couple of burn victims, and um, I will never forget that. I couldn't, I just couldn't do my thing after that. I, it stayed with me for several days, um, probably affected my concentration the next day. Um, and I, I still remember her today. My chest feels a little tight just thinking about it. Maybe I haven't even processed it the way I should have in a healthy way. That kept on going on for like 30 minutes until I just broke down. I was interpreting and crying. I was so, so, so upset. Anything can truly happen in there, and I just have to find a way out and pray that I'll be able to make it to my car and out of the neighborhood in one piece. It was difficult. It was very challenging. I would have said it was the saddest. And he turned around and looked at them very blankly and said, and you still don't speak English. And you don't think it's important to learn. Photojournalist and his Russian interpreter have been killed in eastern Ukraine while covering fighting between government forces and pro-Russian insurgents. Translation. We've all seen the comic ways in which it can go wrong. The Chinese signs that say things like, do drunken driving, <laughs> or f vegetables. Uh, I mean, but to be fair, yes, that's a silly sign, but at the same time, f vegetables, am I right? Am I right? Or, or... Maybe you've seen the YouTube videos where people put songs like Let It Go into Google Translate, then translate them back into English and sing the results. Give up, give up on the rise for radiation. Give up, give up. It runs perfect woman. <laughs> I, I've got to say, that would be an amazing tone for the Frozen sequel. <laughs> A, a bitter woman warbling about defeat in a radioactive ice castle. <laughs> I'm in. I am in. Look, bad translation can be a lot of fun when the stakes are low. But if you're in a war zone, accurate translation can be the difference between life and death. And over the last decade, good local interpreters in Afghanistan and Iraq have saved countless American lives. Let me show you an Afghani man named Sarosh translating a warning about some IEDs. 
He says that there is ISIS. Someone told me that there is ISIS in this way. Abdullah is telling us that the very difficulty they are going to bring about much more than just the human achievement. But the very difficulty they this the very difficulty they are going to do for the world. We just have to last. Okay. Thank you. You see, that is a good message to get exactly right. You don't want someone saying, oh, to be honest, my uh, Pashto's a little shaky, but there's either an IED or an IKEA behind those rocks somewhere. <laughs> also, I, I think he said something about f vegetables. I think... <laughs> Ask any veteran, and they will tell you that translators risked their own lives working for us. And because they did that, they are permanent targets for insurgents. Here's what the translator you just saw, Sarosh, has been up to lately. My relatives told me that, hey, Srosh, be careful, the bad people are looking for you. And uh, please run away. Uh, I'm afraid of that day which the NATO leave Afghanistan, the United States forces leave Afghanistan. It means we are done. They're going to catch me. They're going to probably cut my head off. Probably, you know. They will kill me. Like, my name was added to, to the Taliban kill list. They found my picture and everything. And they knew even when, where I'm living in Kabul. Interpreters have become a very big target of uh, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Uh, there's been a lot of beheadings of people that have worked with uh, the West. And uh, if we completely pull out of Afghanistan and we don't bring these interpreters back, the ones that were promised uh, an opportunity for a visa in the United States, they're going to be killed. I think this documentary is an absolutely wonderful idea because there's expectations about interpreters and people don't know what we go through on a daily basis when we perform our jobs. For example, working in the pediatric intensive care unit, a nurse practitioner began uh, taking the history and physical of the patient from the parents. And at the end of the uh, information, he proceeded to ask the family, can you tell me how long you've been in this country? And I'm interpreting. And the family says, we've been here about 13 years. And then he asked, and how old is your child? And he said, well, she's five. And he turned around and looked at them very blankly and said, and you still don't speak English. And you don't think it's important to learn. And as an interpreter, I was completely taken aback. I had to interpret what he said, still try to preserve that he was going totally against what I believe. I did not support that frame of thought at all. Interpreters are not valued in the workplace. I think people know that they need interpreters, but they don't want interpreters around, and they do feel that is a nuisance. And probably they feel that way because communication could be a lot more, um, more direct if you didn't have the interpreter. But when, when you consider that if you don't have the interpreter, there would be no communication whatsoever, you realize how essential they are. But I just don't really think, um, in, you know, in the workplace in general, people um, are either aware of that or have accepted it. Maybe they're aware, but they haven't accepted it. The, the fact that they need us around, interpreters, you know, they need us. Um, and that we're a good thing, we're a positive thing, we're, we contribute to the process. I think they feel the opposite. I think they feel that we slow down the process, um, we're, you know, we're, we're more of a nuisance, like background noise. I have felt as an interpreter that people don't trust the work that I do. Um, and, you know, the best, the best, I think the best that I can do is just be as professional as I can be and um, just render as accurate of an interpretation as I can render. Um, but truly, there's no way to allay the, that distrust and, and those fears um, because they do feel that everybody should speak English and, um, and they don't understand why you know, we need to have an interpreter. Sometimes I think that providers don't respect um, our profession. I don't think they see it as actually a profession and that we're actually 
making things um, when we're interpreting longer and dragging, they want to go from one patient to the other, and we kind of actually are in the way. There are attorneys who use interpreters as their scapegoats. Um, they use interpreters as, you know, recipients of responsibility and blame for anything that goes wrong. Um, it's very easy to do that because they don't really understand the foreign language part. So it's easy for them to say, you're not, the interpreter is not doing a good job. The case of Nancy Rodriguez Walker is a perfect example of unfair treatment to an interpreter. She was a well-known and respected interpreter in New York, and she was working in a trial when the defense attorney of the person she was interpreting for went and told the judge that Nancy had given him secret information about his client. The judge decided to fire Nancy and ban her from working in court without doing an investigation. That made headlines and really infuriated the interpreter's community that knew this type of situations a little too well. Once she went to trial because she was charged and they did an actual investigation, it was discovered that she was innocent and she was acquitted and the attorney had totally made this up in order to retry the case that he was losing. But because of this, unfortunately, her career was ruined forever. So she decided to sue the judge, the attorney, and the district attorney. position, um, the lawyer, the opponent's lawyer was bilingual, and that happens a lot. When somebody's bilingual, they want to intervene or correct you, or they feel like you didn't interpret correctly. Uh, so this lawyer kept on interrupting me every five minutes or every other question. He would say, no, that's not what my client said. My client said this. And I would say, well, that's what I said, but with different words. And that kept on going on for like 30 minutes until I just broke down. I was interpreting and crying. I was so, so, so upset. And by the way, when I left, he said, oh, you did a good job. And I was like, really? I do know that interpreters are mistreated in the workplace. I myself have been subject to some of it, but I don't think as much as others. And I think it's also because I have not been working as a certified court interpreter for that many years. So I think if I continue to do this, um, I, I, will, I will suffer from, from part of that mistreatment. Um, and I have suffered my fair share, but I think, I think it's okay in general terms. There was an occasion um, when I felt I was mistreated and not respected as a person or as an interpreter. I was, it was in my early days as an interpreter at the hospital. And I went in, the provider did not want to use me um, to interpret. He knew a little bit of Spanish and he thought that I was not needed and totally treated me with disrespect and saying that I needed to leave the room and that um, I was not needed. And I told him it was a policy and I was able to finally, he used me because he's was limited Spanish profession, that was for sure. I have held a couple of different jobs in my life, including as an interpreter. And I can tell you that being an interpreter is one of the most challenging jobs I've ever had. Um, there is, of course, the linguistic challenge where we have to almost operate like machines, like computers, um, with a very small margin of error in cases and with materials that we don't know, we haven't been able to prep most times. So we really just have to be very quick on our feet, very adaptable, um, and just jump into any hospital room or courtroom um, and be ready to interpret on a topic we don't know what it's gonna be. I can recall a time when um, I went home feeling overwhelmed and burnt out. A woman who had given birth and she was from an indigenous community. She was an immigrant who was living in a situation where 
where it was something like human trafficking. Uh, she had been brought to this country with the idea that she would be given a job and an opportunity to go to school, when in fact um, she came to live with um, a family who used her as a housemaid and she suffered some sexual abuse and that is how she ended up pregnant. She came by herself to the emergency room to give birth uh, to her baby. She let the social worker know that she would not be leaving the hospital with her baby, that her bosses did not know where she was, that she would be contacting them to uh, pick her up somewhere different from the hospital location, and she would just try to go back to work and move on with her life. Um, it was late at night. I stayed over my shift. Uh, obviously, uh, this went on for several hours, the social worker trying to help her connect it to a community resource, either to give up the baby for adoption or somehow find her a place where she could be with her baby if that's what she wanted. And it, that back and forth, the emotional stress, the um, making these decisions and just being the interpreter and still trying to educate the social work a little bit with what's going on in our community with with a lot of a lot of immigrants who come here thinking they're coming here for one thing and are end up in these situations eventually uh, the social worker found a place for the baby to go and um, the mother gave up all the rights she signed all the paperwork I can't tell you the details of it, I don't recall them, but but what has stayed with me still is the fact that she said goodbye and she had to leave her child because of her situation. And I went home that night very, very uh, overwhelmed. And that night I cried. I cried a lot. I always thought I was very resilient and I could turn it on and turn it off. Um, I learned that some days you have to talk about the cases that you see. I've learned over the years that you don't have to talk about everything you see and that is a coping mechanism for me. But those are things that I've had to learn on my own. They're not things that I took a class in or that I've been offered at my place of work. Um, resiliency training is not something that is offered openly to interpreters in the medical setting. We're often not part of uh, sessions where team members decompress after a situation like this, after a death. A lot of staff and units come together, and they process it and they move on. Unfortunately, interpreters have to move on to the next assignment. We don't always get that downtime to be able to, to decompress and and get it off your chest. Um, so that was a hard week for me. Um, I think I had a social thing going on that night. I was maybe meeting up with friends and, and I ended up canceling because I couldn't, I just couldn't do my thing after that. I, it stayed with me for several days, um, probably affected my concentration the next day. Um, and I, I still remember her today. My chest feels a little tight just thinking about it. Maybe I haven't even processed it the way I should have in a healthy way. But um, but that's something that definitely I can say. I don't know an interpreter who hasn't experienced vicarious traumas. Okay, so do you, do you have another another story that was very? Um. If you want yes. to. <laughs> I think I'd rather not say that one. Brady has a, a unit, it's the 13th floor, it's a psych unit. And um, I was called because there was a guy over there that needed an interpreter. And he, they gave me a pre-session, you know, um, they gave me, uh, they told me about this, the case. And they were telling me, okay, this is a case, this is a man that has been a, aggressive towards women, sexually aggressive. So sit, sit on um, by the door and, you know, we'll make sure that he's far away from you. Well, 
they were interviewing him, the nurse was interviewing him, and all of a sudden, the patient stands and comes around and grabs me from, from the back. And I, you know, never been touched by a patient. I've never touched a patient before. And I just froze and I said to the nurse, can you get him off my back? <laughs> Maybe two minutes later, he stands up again and grabs me from the back. Now, and this time I stood up grabbed my stuff <laughs> and said to the nurse, I think you need to have this this person more under control. I will have somebody else came come over and substitute me, a male interpreter. And I just laughed. And it took me about two months before I was able to go back to that psych unit. I felt very unsafe, um, unprotected, and pretty much... Um, I got over it because we had a class at Grady about stress and situations like that. And that definitely helped me go back and be able to deal with that unit again. Another experience that I remember is having to interpret for the mother and sister of a 13 year old child that died at the hands of a gang member who was wielding a shotgun. It was very difficult trying to convey the right words of the mom and the sister because they were so overcome with emotion and crying. Um, it was difficult. It was very challenging. I would have to say that was the saddest, trying to maintain composure and talk at the same time. There, there have been some instances when I have felt um, possibly in danger when I have been working as an interpreter. Um, some of the social work visits. Um, for those, I have to go to people's homes and sometimes they are in dangerous neighborhoods and I have to physically go inside of the people's houses. So anything that happens in there, anything can truly happen in there and I just have to find a way out and pray that I'll be able to make it to my car and out of the neighborhood in one piece. Um, but those are times when I have felt that my physical integrity could be in jeopardy. Because of the type of information that as interpreters we're exposed to in the cases that we work for, sometimes we may be exposed to some danger. That includes having to deal with inmates and especially sometimes having to deal with certain types of cases that involve extreme violence. I was at the jail in the interview room with a lawyer and the inmate. And for some reason, I don't know why, the lawyer decided to leave the room. He needed to do something. The thing is, I was alone with this inmate who was fully tattooed. And he asked me, do you know what these tattoos mean? He had like three or four teardrops in his face. I'm like, no, I really don't know. What is it? It's people that you kill. I'm like, really? People that you kill? Mm, interesting. And he said, well, but the murder that they got me here for, that one, I didn't kill. It's very hard for us to absorb everything that the client or the patient um, is conveying, that message, um, and then relaying it in the target language and then to stay completely detached from it. To me, um, I, you know, I do it because I know that I have to do it, but it's a struggle every time. And sometimes I get home and I'm sad and I'm down and I want to cry. And um, sometimes I do. And, you know, my friends are always good, you know, people to, to talk to and vent with. Um, and they, they hear my plight as an interpreter. Interpreters are trained in linguistics. Interpreters are trained in skills regarding languages and interpretation. But we hardly ever receive any type of training on how to handle difficult situations, how to handle disasters. And a lot of times, even if we know a little bit about the case, even if we know what a defendant is being charged with, or if we're in a hospital, even if we know what the illness of the patient is, 
we are almost never prepared or we're not told in advance what we're about to see. Just after nine in the morning, a section of the Atlanta Botanical Gardens Canopy Walk Project, a pedestrian bridge designed to take visitors to treetop level, collapsed. All of a sudden, all of us were called, uh, said 911, to go to a trauma center. Everyone, the director uh, of the department, um, the supervisor, and this was the case when there was a bridge at the Botanical Gardens and uh, the bridge collapsed um, and the workers were all under there. They brought them all to Brady. Um, and it was something that my adrenaline just was, um, I was going from one room to the other, one room to the other. There were two dead people um, that just passed away while I was there, a um, couple of burn victims and, um, I will never forget that. He says, defendant or the FBI or somehow they found in his computer, I think it was like 50 videos of child pornography. And to present the case, um, the, the DA showed four videos. Um, and we had the TV in front of us in the desk. And as much as I avoid look at the computer, I had to, and the defendant was right next to me, and they showed these four videos of child pornography. I mean, extremely horrible child pornography. And till this day, when I remember, it really affects me. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable to, it's unbelievable to believe that a human being can do that to a child. And those images, it's still in my mind. It's, it's really hard to get over that. That was, that was really bad. It was the first patient that I saw die, and I was affected by that. Um, I have seen her. They had called me because that she couldn't breathe. So I came in to the room, and she's looking at me with desperate eyes. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. So I'm... You know, the doctor is right there. She's like very calm. She's like, I'm going to call, you know, the respiratory therapist to give you some therapy. And the doctor said, we don't need you anymore. And I stay there until the therapist came in and started the breathing exercises and everything. So I left. Not even 20 minutes later, they called me. This patient has coded. This patient has coded. Come on, come on right away. And... She had just passed away. Um, we'll never forget her face. We'll never forget that her daughter, the only person she had in the room to hug was me. She ran to me and just was crying on my shoulders. Um, and that was basically something I will never forget ever in my life. There was a case that was really heartbreaking. Uh, it was a defects, uh, home visit, and uh, I accepted this assignment. I had no idea what the charge was. They never tell you that. It was just, it was set up through an agency. And so I show up at the home, and then the, the defects lady shows up too, and she's getting her laptop and all her materials, and I said, uh, what, what, kind of, what kind of case is this? She said, child molestation, and right away my heart just sank to my stomach because I, I really loathed those types of cases, but you had to you had to keep on trotting right through it because there's no turning back. So we get set up in the uh, the father's apartment, and they hadn't even made a police report. I don't think, or it was in the it was in the beginning stages of the case, and the defects worker tells me to to interpret to him. Uh, okay, tell me what happened. So. The father starts explaining that uh, this friend of the family uh, took the kid somewhere and uh, that the, the, the child made some, made some reference to why don't, why don't you apply this uh, inside my rectum the way, the way Mr. So and so does, and uh, the the mother was was just 
alarmed and she then called the police and I think they, they took him to a hospital or something and the doctor was able to make the determination that the boy had been molested. And while the father's telling me this, I'm getting downright nauseous interpreting this to the defects worker and she's just unfazed by it, I guess, and she's so used to it. She's just typing away on her on her laptop. And the kid's right in the room. He's just playing with his toys. He didn't know what's going on. As far as interpreting in very stressful or sad uh, situations, it has affected me in the way that, for the most part, I can get through the encounter, whether it be in court or at the hospital, if it's someone who's lost their life or someone who's been severely hurt and the people who, for whom I'm trying to communicate are very upset. I can usually withhold emotion and get through the encounter. But honestly, as soon as I leave the room or step outside and I'm away from the people that I have to interpret for, I usually have to break down for a moment. Um, depending on what happened or what it's about. Have a good cry, get some water, and then I can come back. It's, we go through a lot. Uh, having to just be the messenger and hold everything in, but there is a point that we have to release. I think it's therapeutic almost. I know that when you're in a room or in a courtroom, and you have attorneys and clients and judges and court reporters and everybody, the hardest job is always the job of the interpreter. He never takes breaks. He doesn't have any margin for error. He cannot make any mistakes. He just has to be perfect 100% of the time, and he is always on. He never takes a break. One morning, I arrived at the courthouse, and there was a plea that was scheduled for that morning. Um, and I initially only had the name of the defendants and the case number. So I looked it up and I realized, oh my goodness, this is going to be a serious one. Um, there were several charges on the indictment, including murder, aggravated assault. Um, and so I wrote down the information on the case, got myself together, went to the courtroom. I saw that there were a lot of family members of the victim side in the courtroom. The media was there and I immediately felt nervous. Um, so for that case in particular, the defendants didn't need me. They were proficient in English, but I was placed to interpret for the mother and uh, the sister of the victim. And uh, we got through the plea. At the end, uh, the state let the judge know that she wanted the victim's family to speak on the stand and give their impact statements. And it was one of the most heart-wrenching things that I've had to interpret. Both the mother and sister were in tears and explaining to the people in the courtroom and the judge that they no longer had their child. They no longer had their sibling. Um, they explained what type of person the victim was, this 13-year-old that had gotten shot and how their lives would be changed forever without it and without him uh, and it was really difficult uh, to get through that to make sure that my interpreting was correct and to try as best i could to not to cry as well there was a case in my early days as an interpreter that i still remember even though that happened about 10 years ago and it was because of the circumstances, because of the details of the case, because of the aftermath, and because everything that was involved in this particular case. In 2005, I received a phone call from a courthouse and they asked for my help. They had a plea and they needed an interpreter to come that afternoon and help. At the time, I was not a certified interpreter and the calls I would get from courthouses were almost non-existent. I showed up that afternoon as instructed 
And unbeknownst to me, that was the case that was going to boost my career as an interpreter. This was a high profile case involving the death of a five year old boy and his grandmother. They had been killed by a teenager who was driving while, while intoxicated. The defendant was pleading guilty and I was interpreting for him. But I learned that the court had called several interpreters. And because this was a high profile case and uh, the news got involved and the media got involved, most of the interpreters that knew about this case did not want to accept it, whether because it was heartbreaking or because they were afraid or intimidated by, by the news and the cameras in the courtroom. This was the first and only case in my career where I have seen a judge crying while imposing the sentence. It was heartbreaking and I had to interpret both the testimonies of the victim's family as well as the defendant and the defendant's family. While I had to keep my composure and I had to keep a straight face because we're not supposed to show any, any emotions. The court was so pleased with my performance and they were so pleased that I was able to help when everybody else turned down this job that they started calling me regularly and I started working directly with this court and then because of this other people started calling me as well attorneys other courthouses and um, I learned a little after that that there there was a group of interpreters there were a few interpreters that were actually campaigning to have me banned from the courts alleging that because I was not a certified interpreter I did not have the right to be working in court. People think that it's easy to be an interpreter because you're bilingual, um, that it's an easy gig, that you make gobs of money, um, and the reality is we don't, um, we don't make that much money and it is very hard to interpret whether it's simultaneously or consecutively, even if you're bilingual. It is a completely different skill that you have to develop and work on it and keep up with it. Um, it's like it's like playing a sport, right? If you don't practice it, you're not good at it. Um, and it takes a lot of practice to become good. People think that an interpreter is somebody that is just bilingual. And it takes a lot more than being bilingual to be an interpreter. Um, I see kids in the past interpreting for their parents. And of course, from the question, they will interpret what is convenient for them. So that's, that's not really interpretation. Here's Jean-Pierre. Oh, you're a French boy. How's that going? I'm breaking up with him. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, you're going to do it for me. What? I don't speak French. I need you to translate, for God's sake. please. Well, all right. I we're having coffee! Sit down! <laughs> Can't imagine why this isn't working. Jean-Pierre, this is Fraser. C'est un plaisir de faire votre connaissance. Now I want to do this gently, so will you tell him that I think he's a really nice guy? Uh -huh. uh, Ross trouve que vous êtes génial. Elle veut rompre avec moi, n'est-ce pas? <laughs> Tant mieux, elle n'est pas mon type. Ça fait quelque temps que je cherche à m'en débarrasser. <laughs> What he say? Um, he says that he he's very fond of you too. Okay, now tell him that these past few weeks have been really fun. You can go faster, Ross. <laughs> Let me do this my way. Tell him. Uh, voyez, elle a tout arrangé. 
si ça ne vous dérange pas de la laisser faire. Hein. Je comprends. Dites-moi, où peut-on manger un bon beefsteak He says, what are you trying to say? Okay, tell him another time, another place. You might have a shot. But this just isn't working for me. Uh, les cinq rounds ont uh, d'excellents faux filets. La carte de vin n'est pas mal non plus. Uh, Faites semblant d'être triste. Est-ce qu'on peut fumer au restaurant Is there any chance you'd reconsider? I don't think so. Uh, vous pouvez fumer dans la patio. Is he okay? Yes, Ross, he'll be fine. But, you know, I think for his sake we should wrap this up, all right? Jean-Pierre. Rose. <laughs> Merci pour conseil, je meurs de faim. He says that he'll... Please, Fraser. some things don't need to be translated. very difficult job at times. Sometimes it can be quite routine and easy and every day. And other times we, uh, we really have to think hard and work hard to uh, earn our, our pay. And as uh, someone has said before, uh, not contrary to popular belief, not every bilingual person is qualified to be an interpreter. It takes a lot of studying and honing and remembering. A lot of memory skills are involved, a lot of multitasking in memory skills. And you have to really expand your vocabulary and just know, know your, your master language or your, um, and the target language. Uh, know it well because you will be required to know it and there are many situations where if you don't have a good master on that language it's gonna show i had two professors who held phds in spanish they were great professors they were completely bilingual and i learned that they had taken the core certification program in that they had taken the oral certification exam and they had not been able to pass. That just shows that being bilingual is not enough to be a good interpreter because being a good interpreter requires a set of skills and those skills require a lot of practice a lot of studies and a lot of knowledge. An Elkhart County man in prison for dealing cocaine near a school, getting his conviction thrown out. Now, the Indiana Supreme Court ruling 5 to 0. Victor Ponce was not properly told about his rights when he pleaded guilty back in 1999. WSBT's Kelly Stepsinski is looking into how this decision could impact other cases. Kelly? Rick, the high court found the judge in this case did everything right, but the court appointed interpreter inaccurately translated Ponce's rights to him in Spanish when he signed a plea agreement. The big question now, did she make the same mistakes in other cases? The problem with cases with illegal immigrants and many times uh, when you're speaking with them, they're going to tend to agree when they don't really understand just to be cooperative. Mark Doty was Victor Ponce's lawyer 15 years ago. When his client pleaded guilty, Ponce's interpreter told the judge Ponce understood a little and spoke a little English. A certified court interpreter recently testified to Indiana Supreme Court justices about court transcripts from that day. The judge said, Mr. Ponce, I now advise you that you have the right to a public and speedy trial by jury. The interpreter said he's he's advising you that you have the right to another another judging speedier, okay? Then the judge said you cannot be compelled to make any statement or testify against yourself at any hearing or trial, but you may remain silent. The interpreter said, and until that date, you cannot make other oaths against yourself, but you can remain silent. There have been a lot of illegal immigrants that have gotten in trouble in Elkhart County 
that probably utilize the same translator. I would imagine that some of those convictions could be um, in question. If that's the case, uh, the cases will be reviewed and we'll go from there. I mean, the bottom line is everybody is, is uh, and particularly my office, is very interested in people being treated fairly. It's not clear how many cases Ponce's interpreter was involved in, but she's no longer working for Elkhart County Courts. And even though Prosecutor Curtis Hill was not in office back then, he says the system could have been better. You had more of a haphazard system where uh, is there anybody in the courtroom who can speak the language? In 2003, the Indiana Supreme Court started a program that certifies and sets ethical standards for courtroom reporters, but courts in Indiana not required to have certified interpreters. Most courtrooms in Elkhart and St. Joseph counties do, though. It's up to a judge to qualify them, ask them questions to make sure they're able to do the work. I'm not quite sure that the general layperson on the outside looking in understands what we do and what we go through. Um, a lot of people say, oh, you're just talking, this is an easy job. But they don't realize that you sort of have to be a jack of all trades. You have to know a little bit of everything uh, so that you can converse adequately and proficiently in both languages. Uh, it involves a lot of thinking on your feet and it can be very stressful, especially at times if you're in a situation where it's a subject matter that you haven't spoken about in detail or in depth in either language. And um, you have to sort of learn on your feet. All of the certified interpreters that I have met um, are people that I know go above and beyond to do a very proficient and competent work as interpreters. I chose to be an interpreter and I chose to make interpretation, translation, in languages, my career, and I went to school for it. I took trainings on how to become an interpreter. I became a certified interpreter with the state of Georgia at the age of 26. And it makes me very proud because in my case, it wasn't easy. I feel like I'm from a new breed of interpreters. I feel that I belong to that breed of interpreters that wanted to be interpreters as a career. I didn't choose this as a second career. I have been taking interpreting courses uh, even before I finished high school. I'm very proud to be an interpreter and work in this community. And I learn from my fellow interpreters every day. And this job is rewarding. It doesn't pay as well, um, but that's why I make a living because it's rewarding and because, because I like what I do. We are the most adaptable people out there and um, the job, the work that we provide and the services that we provide are essential, um, especially nowadays where, you know, globalization being what it is, everybody has to, to talk to people in, you know, from other countries and other languages or, or in the professional world. I also think any interpreter that you meet um, is going to be a very interesting person because he or she is going to have myriad ex of experiences because of the job that we do. It's not the best paying job. I do think that uh, interpreters are underpaid, whether it be judicial, medical, um, whether it be at the community health level or at the hospital level, uh, which people in the community think or in our society think that if you work for a court or if you work for a hospital, you must make great money and um, and then maybe almost like you have it easy. But um, choosing to do this job doesn't stem from how much am I gonna make. Um, it's, it's the fact that this job is rewarding on a consistent basis, if not day to day, hour to hour. Um, that's what, that's why I chose to make this my career. I know that there's, there are times that, as an interpreter, you have to manage yourself well because you go through periods where you're super busy and you need to uh, find someone else with whom you can share the work, recommend a coworker, uh, because you can't handle everything, even though you'd like to and you love to make the money. And then there are times where it's so slow, the phone isn't ringing, no one needs you, and this is specifically as a freelancer, if that's all that you're doing. Um, 
But even though I know it's something that's not going to make me rich, it's definitely a fulfilling job. So I love it. I would recommend it to anyone who's interested. I don't think you can become and make a big living all of a sudden. You have to go through the steps, educating yourself, um, have passion for being an interpreter, um, love it, be dedicated, you'll get well known. Um, and it's not about who's being the best. It's not about who is going to have all of these certificates. You can be a brain. You can be so intelligent and have all these certificates about medical or legal. But if you if you don't have the passion, the patience, and the vision of how things are changing, this is all what makes us. I know that it's a source of comedy at times in the news when we hear these stories about interpreters that made a grave mistake and they said something terrible and the interpreters get vilified in the media. And it sort of makes me feel bad because no one thinks the stress that the person is under. And those who are on the outside just looking in and watching certainly would have come up with something better and more precise sitting comfortably on the sides, whereas we're in the heat of the moment and we have to come up with something. And that's not to excuse the error especially if it has a negative consequence, but it's definitely something that needs to be considered. Stacey, can you ask uh, Nini, first of all, if they have many earthquakes in her part of the world? Yes. Uh, Se tiene muchos terremotos en Colombia. Bueno, no precisamente terremotos, pero Colombia se presta mucho a movimientos sísmicos, puesto que el relieve es un poco eh, variable. Not many. Not many. Ladies and gentlemen, what can I say? Miss Colombia. Thank you.